I'm reading this morning from 1 Samuel, it says 1, chapter 1, but it's actually chapter 2. 1 Samuel 2, verses 1 to 3. This is part of a prayer by the woman named the name of Hannah. You'll hear more about her in the message. 1 Samuel 2, verses 1 to 3. Hannah prayed, The Lord has filled my heart with joy. How happy I am because what he has done. I laugh at my enemies. How joyful I am because God helped me. No one is holy like the Lord. There is none like him. No protector like our God. Stop your loud, uh, your loud boasting. Silence your proud words, for the Lord is a God who knows, and He judges all people that do. Part of Hannah's wonderful prayer and praise, you'll understand later why she prayed in this way. For now, Dr. Wachi will join me as we bring you the message of the morning in English when he hung on. Incidentally, you have received either an English or a Japanese scripture for this morning, and you can follow my words. You can look at the verses as I cite them. And uh, either everybody have the language they need, Japanese or English. Okay. Heavenly Father, let the words of Yasko san and I, our mouths, be acceptable to you. Guide us as we speak. And may the thoughts of all of our hearts also be acceptable to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I've just read part of the prayer by a woman named Hannah. Now Hannah is a woman who many consider to be a model for motherhood. But this morning, I'd like you to see something else about this woman. I'd like you to see that Hannah is also a woman of great faith. We learn of Hannah in the first two chapters of First Samuel. And as we look at those chapters, we note that Hannah had five important qualities that were typical of women of faith. The first is in verses 1 to 8 where we see that, like everybody else, Hannah had real problems. You know, sometimes it's easy to think that the heroes and the heroines in the Bible were somehow different than we are. But actually, the Bible is filled with real people who have real problems, but who face them with real faith. Now, Hannah 
Her problems started after her marriage to a man named Elkanah, who had two wives, Hana and Penina. Penina had children, but Hana had none. Now, a wife's chief responsibility in those days was to provide breakfast, no, children. <laughs> And so, since Hana had not provided children, she would probably have been looked down upon. Now, verse 3 tells us that Elkanah and his two wives made a yearly visit to Shiloh to worship the Lord at the tabernacle there. Of course, this tells us he was devoted to the Lord. But verses 4 and 5 tell us something else about his devoted heart. He gave portions of the meat, the sacrificial meat that was permitted to be eaten to Penina and her children. But to Hana, to Hana, he gave a double portion because he loved Hana. Having a husband who expressed his love probably helped Hana a whole lot. So we know Elkanah was sincere in his walk with God and he was devoted to Hana. But gosh, Elkanah had a divided family. Of course, the original cause for this division was Elkanah's decision to marry two wives. It's highly likely, highly likely, that Elkanah had married Hana first, and then, since she wasn't able to have children, he decided to marry Penina. Notice, though, this is important. Notice that while the Bible records such relationships, it never endorses them. God's word teaches the one wife rule. Now, as you might expect, these two wives didn't get along too well. But the most difficult thing, the most difficult problem that Hana faced is what's said in verse 5 and then again in verse 6. In both verses it says, and the Lord had closed her womb. So the problem that Hana had came from the Lord. This is one of the hardest lessons we'll ever learn. 
It's God who's behind the circumstances in life. We don't really want to believe this. But remember, it's God who allows both good things, allows both good things and bad things to come into our lives. He's in charge, and so we should echo Job's faith when he said, Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Verse 6 also describes the character and personality of Penina. It simply says that Penina kept provoking Hana in order to irritate her. Hmm. She felt the need, apparently, to harass Hana. Now that bothered Hana so much that she would cry and not be able to eat. Elkanah, as any husband would, tried to comfort his wife. He said, Hana, why are you crying? Why don't you eat? This is my Jewish accent. <laughs> Why are you so downhearted? But listen to this one. Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Elkanah was doing what many of us husbands do when our wives are upset. Instead of listening to her pain, he was trying to rationalize her problems and feelings. He was trying to solve her problem when he should have been trying to just understand her. And again, notice what he said. <laughs> said, Hana, you've got me. What else would you want? <laughs> I just don't think Elkanah understood. Now maybe some of you ladies maybe at some time have been hit with insensitive comments. Well, if you have, just remember this. They may not understand, but God does. Then notice also, Hana, like most women of faith, didn't lash out at those around about her. Instead, in verses 9 through 18, she expressed her faith in her prayers. Hannah 
Notice, her problem didn't drive her to lash out at people around her. Instead, her problem drove her to prayer. Our problems, our problems should drive us to prayer. Listen to verses 10 through 11. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. You see, Hannah's crying led her to worship as her tears mingled there with her prayers. But Hannah, she appealed to the Lord's power and authority because she knew there was nothing that she could do herself. And as part of her prayer, she made a vow that if she was given a son, she would, he would be dedicated to the Lord for his entire life. See, Hannah realized a very important truth. Children are not just for parents. They're for the Lord. Nothing we have, not even our children, really belong to us. They're on loan to us. And it's our job to parent, to shepherd, to train those children for the Lord's work. <laughs> it's significant too that this prayer was a repeated request that was bathed in tears. But she didn't pray audibly, she prayed in her heart. We don't always have to pray out loud because our thoughts are just like words to God. You know, the Bible says that before the word leaves your tongue, God already knows what you're saying. But her quiet prayer had an unfortunate consequence when Eli, the high priest, seeing her lips move and no words come out, accused her of being drunk. <laughs> When she explained her situation, Eli said, Ah, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. Israel 
this blessing was a huge, huge, this benediction was a huge blessing to Hannah. Now, Eli didn't know what she was praying about, but as high priest, he gave his Amen to her request. She had left her concerns with the Lord and she had experienced the peace that passes all understanding. God will do that for us. Philippians tells us that if we will stop worrying and start praying, He will give us peace. Well, never underestimate the power of a woman's praying. Susanna Wesley spent one hour praying each day for her 17 children. With 17 children, she had to pray. But it's no wonder that two of her sons, Charles and John, were used mightily for the Lord, by the Lord, in England and America. So what's the point? The point is that as a woman of faith, Hannah didn't hide her problems. She displayed them. But, and this is important, she then responded to those problems with prayer. Verse 19 then says she got up early the next morning, worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back home. A short time later, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son and named him Samuel. This leads to a third defining characteristic of Hana. As a woman of faith, she experienced God's provision for her. But I want to be careful here. Just because Hana's prayer for a son were answered, that doesn't mean that everyone who prays for a child will be given one. But God will provide for you one way or the other. As we sing here in the chapel often, God will make a way when there seems to be no way. But as a woman of faith, Hannah kept her promises. And so after Samuel was born, when Elkanah once again went to Shiloh in order to worship, Hannah decided not to go until Samuel was weaned. Samuel 
She dedicated herself to her child, nursing and nurturing him, knowing that when he was able to eat on his own, she would take him and present him before the Lord. Many people make promises to God, then they forget them once time and the problem passes. But Hannah, Hannah fully intended to keep her promise. And just as she dedicated herself to her child, she dedicated her child to the Lord. So later she brought Samuel to the house of the Lord and said, Now I give him to the Lord, for his whole life will be given over to the Lord. And the chapter ends with these words, and he, that is Samuel, worshipped the Lord there. Even at his tender young age, Samuel was able to worship. How do you think he learned to do this? Hannah no doubt took the exhortation to impress upon her the son's, her son's heart the words of Deuteronomy 6 seriously. You know, it's one thing to say that our children are dedicated to the Lord. It's another thing altogether to give them to the Lord. But that's the kind of love that Hannah had for Samuel. She loved him so much that she was willing to forego bringing him up and having him around her. She was willing to do whatever it took for him to reach his godly potential. Then, as a woman of faith, Hannah had one more important characteristic. Her faith moved her to pray. We don't have time this morning to say much about Hannah's beautiful psalm of praise, but I do want to point out that there is no element of sadness at all in that prayer. She had just dropped Samuel off at the temple, then she broke out in praise to God. She was thrilled to be able to parent a prophet. The prophet who would anoint the king, King David of Israel.
Hannah had endured years of silent suffering and harassment at the hand of her rival, Penina. But each year, she went to the place of worship, and as painful as it was, and there she faithfully worshipped, pouring out tears and petitions. Then when God had answered her prayer, she not only kept her promise, but she broke out in praise to him. You can read it in First Samuel two, two. First Samuel two. Hannah's example of women of faith. So, here are some closing thoughts for all the women on this Mother's Day. First, you're, a, you're of great worth in God's sight whether or not you have a child. So lift up your head and realize that God loves you not for what you do, but for who you are. Women, He understands you and he'll meet you right where you are. But mothers, grandmothers, make it your mission to give your children and your grandchildren to the Lord for a lifetime of dedicated service. Now that doesn't mean they will necessarily be pastors or missionaries, but their lives will be lived for the Lord. There's no greater purpose, there's no greater honor than to serve, to have your children live their lives in surrendered service to the Lord. You know, one of the lessons from the life of Hannah is that each of us needs to be growing, growing in our own relationship to God. So, if you want your kids or your grandkids brought up to be brought up in a Christian home, the first thing you have to do is to make sure that you have Christ in your heart. Then if he is, spend the rest of your life giving your children or your grandchildren back to the Lord. You see, 
they belong to him anyway. Hana, a model mother, but also a woman of great faith. Our Heavenly Father, as we've looked at this life, life of Hannah, and discovered in her life, Lord, a woman of faith. We too want to be people of faith. Women of faith, yes. Men of faith as well. Trusting in you and you alone. Knowing that there's nothing we can do ourselves, for ourselves, that would earn us a place in heaven. But that place is reserved for us because of our trust in Jesus and the work that He has already done, paying the price by dying for us, paying the price for our sin. Lord, Men and women of faith is what you call us to be. Give us courage. Give us courage, yes. Give us understanding and guide us to become that man or that woman of faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.